Hello class and welcome to week six. This is our final week of the class and I want to start off this class by reading a portion of a poem called Autumn by a 13 year old girl. Oh, what a beauty doth the world put on these peerless, perfect autumn days. There's a beauty spirit of gladness everywhere. The wooded waysides are luminous with brightly painted leaves. The forest trees with royal grace have domed their gorgeous autumn tapestries. And even the rocks are broidered with fern, sumacs, and brightly tinted ivies. But so exquisitely blended are the lights and shades, the gold, scarlets, and purples, that no sense is wearied, for God himself hath painted the landscape. That little poem, or a portion of that poem at least, was written by, as I mentioned, a 13-year-old girl. But what I didn't mention is that girl was both blind and deaf. And yet, she was able to create this beautiful poem. Written by Helen Keller. The first blind deaf woman to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in the United States. Today we're going to be taking a look at students with sensory impairments, traumatic brain injury, as well as students at risk. So just to start off with, many conditions that occur relatively rarely in children can result in significant challenges for these students, their families, school personnel, and other professionals. Uh, things like hearing impairments, visual impairments, traumatic brain injury, health, and physical problems all come under this category. Often school support personnel for Teachers and students with these types of conditions are people like physical therapists, psychologists, speech-language pathologists. Uh, under the heading of sensory impairments, we can really think of uh, the category of sensory impairments to include hearing impairments and visual impairments. And students with sensory impairments may be at a distinct disadvantage in academic settings because of the extent that hearing and vision are used in teaching and learning. Many students with sensory impairments are often placed in general education settings. For these students to receive an appropriate education, a variety of adaptations and accommodations may be needed. For example, seating adjustments, assistive technology, an interpreter or a braille instructor may be needed. And sensory impairments are considered low incidence disabilities. Uh, and so these students represent a small percentage of all the students and children with exceptionalities. But that doesn't mean that they are any less important. And it just means that we need to be very mindful of their needs and recognize that we need to plan out how we can meet their needs. So let's start off with hearing impairments. Um, like many of these um, struggles that children have, it's a hidden disability. Um, when students with profound hearing loss um, what we would call deafness are educated in the general education classroom they may need some major accommodations for example they may need an interpreter uh, students who have some degree of hearing from mild to severe usually can function in a general education setting with some accommodations and students with 
minimal hearing loss, um, hearing losses that are not severe enough to be eligible for special education services, are at a distinct disadvantage in the general education classroom if their problems are not recognized by the classroom teacher or by others um, that they are dealing with. Students who have cochlear implants may also be included in the regular classroom. Now, hearing loss, even in milder forms, can greatly affect a child's language ability. And this will inevitably lead to problems in academic areas, and particularly in language-related subjects, such as reading and writing expression. Language is a dominant consideration when discussing what is an appropriate education for students with hearing loss. And we can really think of hearing impairment um, as, and some things around this as, for example, educators should understand the meaning of different terms associated with hearing impairment so that they can uh, avoid confusion when working with children and their families and other professions. So let's start off with hearing impairment. Hearing impairment, when we use that term, we're really just speaking in generic terms. And that term hearing impairment is used to describe any level of hearing loss, ranging from the mild to the profound. Now deafness, deafness is a hearing loss that is so profound that the auditory canal that part of the ear cannot function as the primary mode for perceiving and monitoring speech or acquiring language. And that is the case with or without a hearing aid. And then we can speak in terms perhaps of hard of hearing and that describes an individual who has hearing loss but have difficulty using the auditory channel as their primary mode for perceiving and monitoring speech or acquiring language with or without a hearing aid. So just uh, s some subtle variability in there. Now, when we speak of hearing loss, we're really speaking in terms of perceiving and processing decibels of sound. So when we, when we think of it, a profoundly hearing impaired person has a hearing loss greater than 90 decibels. A hard of hearing person has a hearing loss between 26 and 90 decibels. And a minimal hearing loss is hearing loss between 16 and 50 decibels. Sorry, between 26 and 50 decibels. Now, when we speak of the classification of hearing impairment, hearing loss can really be categorized in a number of ways. There are typically described by three attributes. The type of hearing loss, the degree of hearing loss, for example, minimal to profound, and the configuration of hearing loss, so flat, sloping, reverse, bilateral, or unilateral, or fluctuating, or stable. So under this, conductive hearing loss occurs when sounds are not conducted efficiently through the outer and middle ears. And this may be the result of, for example, impacted earwax. Um, a buildup of fluid in the middle ear or an ear infection. Then there's sensory neural hearing loss and that occurs when there's damage to the inner ear and this may be the result of for example an injury sustained at birth or a tumor. Then there can be mixed hearing loss and this occurs when both a conductive and sensory neural hearing loss are present. 
and all these types of hearing loss can adversely impact a child's speech and language development and their academic achievement and so it's important to be mindful of all of these types of hearing loss but then there is also auditory processing disorders an APD and that is associated with hearing loss but typically found is is present in individuals without a hearing impairment it may be broadly defined as a deficit in the processing of information that is specific to the auditory modality and this may be the result of for example head trauma or congenital brain damage now the prevalence and causes of these issues approximately uh, 0 0.14 percent of the children that you will encounter in a school setting will experience hearing impairments within Canada and it's estimated that between 2 and 5 percent of the total population has some degree of hearing loss across all ages and there are many causes of hearing impairments and as I mentioned um, some of them but they can be genetic causes uh, can be birth trauma there's lots of different reasons why people experience hearing loss and children experience hearing loss but some of the characteristics the characteristics obviously are going to vary widely for hearing impairment but some possible characteristics of children with hearing impairments involve uh, the psychological, the communicational, the social and emotional and the academic areas are going to be affected fairly significantly. So when we look at the identification, the assessment and some possible eligibility for, for resources, first off we need to look at the child and, and see are we recognizing the severity of the hearing loss. Is the child, for example, with mild loss going for years unrecognized? It's important for us to be aware that hearing loss can impact children profoundly. And so teachers and people working with children should keep careful records of behaviors and if possible work with the team to have the student evaluated for a comprehensive audiological evaluation if needed and so we can think in terms of a formal assessment and there are a variety of audiological techniques that are used by an audiologist to assess hearing uh, the most common being something called the pure tone audiometry where they me are measuring the uh, ability to perceive different sounds but we can also do informal assessments so an informal assessment would be simply observing the student for signs that they may indicate a hearing loss so for example a restricted vocabulary they fidget in their seat that sort of thing and from there working remember working with the team is essential and evaluating the eligibility for possible resources based upon the provincial or territorial guidelines associated with those needs now there's some realities within the classroom that we really should keep in mind here that students with hearing impairments are going to vary greatly in their needs for supports in the general education classroom and students with mild hearing loss typically need minimal support um, however there are some some fairly common techniques that can be used for example in New Brunswick um, it has become standard that teachers will have uh, a mic that they wear around their neck as a little necklace 
and the, the sound amplification for the teacher's voice within every classroom. That is a very simple way of helping children with mild to moderate hearing loss to be able to engage in the classroom very easily without any extra supports. Um, there can also be amplification assistance that will enable the child to hear clearly for themselves personally. And there's also uh, an opportunity for a continuum of placement options. So students with hearing impairments may be educated throughout the continuum of placement depending upon their individual needs. And that may be from the general education classroom through to a specialized residential school for the deaf. Um, although, again, that is something that is somewhat counter to inclusion and so has been less viewed as less desirable with this trend that we have with an education for inclusion and then the topic of educational placement for this population really has generated a, a lot of controversy uh, as with all students with exceptionalities there is no single educational setting that is best for students with hearing impairments so just to keep that in mind as we move forward and a lot of what we've said with auditory impairments also applies for visual impairments um, when we think in terms of visual impairments, vision really plays a critical role in the development of concepts, the understanding of spatial relationships, and the use of printed materials. And teaching students with severe visual impairments requires specialized instruction. So, for example, using Braille or optical devices. Uh, general education classes can be appropriate for students with visual impairments with the appropriate supports. Educators should understand the meaning though of the different terms associated with visual impairments to avoid some confusion when working with the children and their families and with other professionals. So for example, um, visual impairment really just is a generic term to describe a wide range of visual problems. Blindness has different meanings depending upon the context. For example, legal blindness refers to a person's visual acuity and field of vision. It's defined as a visual acuity of 20 over 200 or less um, in the person's better eye after correction or a field of vision of 20 degrees or less. Low vision, however, indicates that some functional vision exists to be used for gaining information with or without the use of technological assistance, so like an optical device. Now students with low vision are capable of handling typically the demands of most classroom settings. Students who are blind or have very little or no vision will need major adaptations and typically some accommodations to be successful in the general education classroom. Now as far as classification goes, the visual problems can be categorized in a number of ways refractive disorders, so for example farsighted, nearsighted astigmatisms or retinal disorders of the cornea uh, the iris and lens and optic nerve problems now regardless of the cause of the vision problem professionals primarily have to deal with its functional results whether or not the child um, for example has usable residual vision or 
if some problems have developed around that. Now, the prevalence and causes um, visual problems are common in our society. Corrective lenses allow most individuals to see very effectively, but some vision problems cannot be corrected by lenses. And so approximately 0.06% of students are classified as visually impaired within Canada. Now, unlike hearing loss, people with visual impairments typically are easily identified. Students with milder losses may go several years, however, without being recognized. And we can look at uh, visual assessments. Um, child will typically go through regular vision assessments and are e usually easily identified. And there's really two parts to an eye examination that assesses visual acuity as well as field of vision. And visual acu acuity is most often evaluated by that chart that we're all well aware of, the Snellen chart. And then there's, the, of course, the informal assessments. And this type of assessment really focuses on observations where typically a teacher or other school personnel will note behaviors that indicate some vision loss or change in the vision of the child. So we just kind of need to keep in mind that um, if a child has been assessed with a 2 over 200 acuity or worse in their better eye with correction that they are identified as blind and clearly eligible for some significant supports within the education system for meeting their needs in training. Um, some of the instructional and curriculum issues that will person will need to keep in mind, students with visual impairments are going to need some accommodations, some adaptations and some accommodations. So something for example like enlarged printed material um, will, will be needed. And of course there's that continuum of placement options depending upon the specific needs of the child. And there are also some educational considerations that should be made. So is the child able to operate with standard operating procedures? Or are there physical considerations that need to be made? Does the child need to know, for example, with, with the visual impairments, does the child need to know the physical layout of the classroom so that they can navigate it without harming themselves? Um, and are there some pre-instructional considerations? So are class schedules um, arranged in a way that the child can be allowed extra time and can use large print or braille materials for test taking procedures? All of that and for note taking um, and for time management and for keyboarding, all of which we need to keep in mind. Um, so when we're when we're talking about um, materials and equipment, primarily what we're talking about are large print materials. Um, is there adequate size and contrast of the print? It is there opportunities for magnification available? Um, be careful not to use um, low cr contrast materials or books printed on glossy paper. They can be difficult for children to read. And so teachers and other professionals may want to use concrete materials, so realistic representations of actual items in certain in instances to be able to engage the visually impaired more uh, adequately. And then of course there's some social and emotional considerations to, to keep in mind. That 
many children with visual problems will benefit from attention to their social and emotional development. Um, having some special support for developing their social skills may be particularly useful since social skills are typically learned by observing others. And that can go a long ways for promoting the well-being of the child and supporting their function within an inclusive setting. And let's go on a little, talk a little bit about um, traumatic brain injury, TBI. Traumatic brain injury, TBI, is defined as an injury to the head that may cause interference with normal brain function. Traumatic brain injury can result from a wide variety of causes. It can be um, motor vehicle accident, physical abuse, something as simple as a bicycle accident or sports in injury. So, for example, in hockey or soccer or football, um, brain injuries are common. Assaults, skiing accidents, all of those can, can result in traumatic brain injury. And information about the severity of the traumatic brain injury is important for teachers to know as it can help to provide a sense of the expected long-term outcomes as well as the specifics of the social functioning. Now there are many persistent features of TBI and these are going to include problems in the areas of physical and mental functioning, sensory processing, cognitive processing, language development and use, and behavioral and emotional control. And it's going to depend largely on the location and the severity of the traumatic pain injury, what areas of functioning are going to be um, impacted. And overall, in the long term, it's, it will be important for you to understand the different areas of the brain and what the different areas of the brain can do but unfortunately this is not a biopsychological course and so we're going to not focus on uh, so much the structures of the brain as what we can do to help students and children with traumatic brain injury. Um, when it comes to education an effective educational program remember is going to create a positive attitude about the student's prognosis and that goes a long way to helping the child to have a positive view of themselves to develop a positive attitude about communicating with others and engaging in the educational process and so a well-planned program of instruction should focus on retaining impaired cognitive processes, developing new skills or procedures to compensate for residual deficits, and creating an environment that permits effective performance. Identifying instructional procedures that work with the child and improve the metacognitive awareness of the child so they have a good sense of how they do function as well. Now remember, um, just like any child, a child with a TBI is going to want to be happy. And so they're going to want to experience flow. And flow means being able to engage in something, being able to engage in something successfully, and finding meaning within that. And so there needs to be a, a skill challenge balance where the child can succeed when significant attention and effort is given to it. So it's an effortful success. And when there's an effortful success, that is when a child will begin to enjoy it not too hard but not too easy. Overall I just want you to remember that despite the impairments that a child may have whether that be uh, hearing impairment, visual impairment, 
traumatic brain injury, some other issue, that there is a creative, desiring person inside that, given the right opportunities, can really flourish. And Helen Keller is a great example of someone that was able to flourish despite the many challenges that she faced. And I think that that kind of flourishing is possible with any of the children that we are working with and dealing with. And I want to leave you with that thought. And I hope that you enjoyed this course. You take care. Bye-bye.